Hello and welcome to the Somerset Archaeological and Natural History Society's webinar about fascinating fungi. My name's Lizzie Indooney and I'm a trustee for the Somerset Archaeological and Natural History Society, more commonly known as SANS. I'm also the chair of the Historic Buildings Committee of SANS. Today we're going to hear a lecture by Steve Parker about fascinating fungi. Steve Parker has worked for Natural England as a conservation officer in Somerset since 1994. He's interested in all aspects of natural history and conservation. Steve, who lives in North Petherton, currently works on the conservation of the Somerset levels and moors. His interest in fungi goes back to the 1980s when he lived in Kent and would go on field meetings with the Kent Field Club. On moving to Somerset, he joined Sands and has taken part in their annual fungus foray. If you've got any thoughts or queries about the lecture, you can send in questions by activating a questions and answer button, a Q&A button at the bottom of your page and typing in a message. To find the button, just run your mouse over the bottom of your screen and a series of buttons should pop up. If the button's not there, it might be at the top right or even hidden under three dots. At the end of the lecture, I will field particularly interesting questions to Steve who will be able to respond. This lecture will be recorded and will be available on YouTube. Because of this, I won't be mentioning names during the Q&A session at the end. If you are um, enjoying the lecture, which is free, you might want to give a donation to SANS. The donations button is on the Somerset Archaeological and Natural History Society website event page. A link to the donations page will also be posted in the chat button at the end of the lecture. The chat button, like the Q&A button, is found at the bottom of your screen or possibly under a three dots menu. So, over to Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Welcome to this SANS talk on fungi. Uh, this is going to take the form of a virtual fungus foray, visiting some of the uh, locations in Somerset that we've been to in the last 20 years or so. Our fungi will look at uh, woodlands, and uh, this is an especially rich habitat coming to life in the autumn when a wide range of mushrooms and toadstools of all state shapes and sizes spring from the ground. First, a few groups that we will not look at in any detail as we go on a walk. Lichens, a lichen is not a single organism. It's a stable symbiotic association between a fungus and an algae and a cyanobacteria. The slide shows a uh, SANS member and international recognised expert, Pat Walsley, leading an event uh, a couple of years ago. Well, on the right is uh, an example of a, of a lichen, the tree lungwort. This is now very rare in, in Somerset, probably due to the pollutants in the atmosphere. These organisms are very uh, susceptible to um, to uh, air, airborne uh, pollutants, such as uh, sulfur dioxide. Another group we will not look at in any detail are the slime moulds, fascinating as they are. So slime moulds is a, an informal name that's given to several kinds of unrelated eukaryotic organisms that can live freely as single cells but then can aggregate together to form a multicellular reproductive structure. Slime molds were once formally classified as fungi, but they're no longer considered to be in that kingdom. So the woodlands we're going to look at are very complex ecosystems, with most of the action beneath the soil. The recently discovered wood wide web where fungi and trees have developed 
what is called a mycorrhizal relationship is mutually beneficial to both the trees and the fungi. It's a kind of molecular conversation between the mycelium, that's the fine white threads that form the fungi, and the tree roots. Sometimes the fungi grow on the outside of the root, and at other times it grows actually into the root. And then there's an exchange between the fungi and the tree, both benefiting, benefiting from that relationship. Fungi, together with bacteria and invertebrates, are critical to the recycling of nutrients within a woodland ecosystem, feeding vital resources back to the living plants and animals. And if it weren't for fungi, of course, we'd be shoulder high in dead wood. Dead wood, which is an incredibly valuable habitat, is also home to, to many rare and uh, exciting looking fungi. Um, they also play a part in the decomposition of animals. So the poor old badger on the right here um, is long gone, but is being slowly returned to the soil. There's an increasing evidence of the value to people of not of being in the outdoors. We found that over the last year, I guess, with the terrible COVID instance that's happened. A foray is a great way to uh, spend some time in the countryside. You're improving your well-being, and of course, you never know what strange and wonderful fungi you might find. There are, of course, rules to collecting. Never take too much or never damage the environment. And you have to be careful where you collect. Organisations such as the National Trust now have strict rules on collecting. And you should always have the landowner's permission. By over collecting, we can damage the very things that we're interested in. So every year, SANS holds a fungus foray. Most years, we, we go out in October when the fungi can be at their very best. But this is dependent on the weather, particularly the rainfall. For many years, we've been led by Dr. Philip Radford, who would take us onto the Quantock Hills, where we would break up into small groups to search for mushrooms and toadstools and then come back together to meet up with Philip. He would then expertly identify and discuss the natural history of the fungi that we found. There are many excellent field guides. So if you want to learn more, I recommend you search from the local bookshops. Most of them are actually called British Mushrooms and Toadstools. So they go by the, the author's name or well, the name of the publishers. Have a look and you'll find lots of very interesting books out there. To start with, it helps to learn some of the basic information and technical terms used in the study of fungi or mycology as it's called. Here we've got a, a composite a picture of a, of a fungi where you can see the cap, bright red here in this case, uh, with sometimes it has scales on top. Uh, Underneath the cap are either gills or, in some cases, tiny pores. This is where the microscopic spores are shot from and they drift on the air currents through the atmosphere and then, with luck, they find somewhere to germinate. So the cap is, is held up by the stipe or the stalk of the fungi and here you can see a ring in this example. On the bottom, there may be a bag-like structure called the vulva, or there may be scales. And all of these things are worth noting if you're trying to identify the particular toadstool you've got. Key features such as the shape of the cap or the shape of the stalk or the stipe are important. Other things to look for is what is the colour? Is the colour of the cap the same as the colour of the stipe? 
look for the presence of scales on the surface here. And it's important to note the habitat you're in. So are you in a conifer woodland? Are you in a beech woodland? Or in the grassland? And note the type of trees that you're under, for example. But don't forget those mycorrhizal relationships where the fungi and the tree are dependent on each other. It's also sometimes relevant to, to smell the fungi. Does it have a very distinctive smell? And if you're brave, you can taste a very tiny amount, but only a very tiny amount. And remember to spit it out once you've just tasted a little. So once back on our fungus foray, we would rejoin Philip and then group all the different fungi together on a, on a large table. Here we have a collection of fungi that we've collected with pores. This is a group known as the Belites or Belitas. And in the British Isles are about 70 different species. However, not all fungi have fruiting bodies like a cap and get with gills or pores underneath. Here we've got a tiny fungi called holly speckle, and this is helping decompose a holly leaf. This is an example of what is called an ascomycete fungi, where the spores are shot out of a little sack called an asco. The leaf is, showing, is slowly rotting away. This is a common fungi that can be found well into the winter period. But as you can see, the fungi are actually very small. Here we have a very large fungi, one of the largest we found in the British Isles, the giant polypore, which can grow to about 80 centimetres across. The example here growing, is shown growing on a rotting stump. Here we've come across two well-known fungi. Both are Amanita species. Growing under a birch tree is the colourful fly agaric. Bright red with white scales on the surface of the cap. These scales are the remains of the bag that once enclosed the fungi during its development in the soil. And then the bag tore open as the toadstool erupted from the ground. The other is the death cap. And this is capable of causing serious harm to humans, or even in some cases, death. The amatoxins are able to destroy the body cells, especially those of the liver and the kidneys. About half a cap or 30 grams can be fatal to a human. There were some 39 fatalities in the United Kingdom between the 1920s and the 1950s. The last known fatality in Britain was in 2008. So it's very rare, but be aware. So moving on from the Amanitas, we next come to a group called the Lactarius or the milk caps. These are found in woodland and many of them form these mycorrhizal relationships. And the one I'm showing here is the oak bug milk cap. When broken, the gills produce a white fluid. This species is reported to have a smell like big bugs, although goodness only knows what big bugs smell. Other books say it smells like rose petals, so take your choice. Closely related to the milk caps are the rushulas. This is a large group with about 145 species in Britain. They're very difficult to identify, but there are only about 20 that are commonly encountered. 
So these erupt from the woodland soil. They're very brightly colored with reds, yellows, greens in some cases. But the color is not a really good indication of the species as it can be washed out by the rain. A key feature of these brittle gills is, as the name suggests, is the gills underneath the cap are very fragile. If you brush your finger across them, they break. All the members of the group have white spores. And a way of identifying fungi once you've returned from the field is actually to just put the cap on a piece of paper and form a fungi um, spore print. But with these ones, of course, they're white spores, so you need colored paper to actually see them. And then to actually determine which species it is, you need to look at the spores through a microscope, see how they're structured, how big they are. So moving on, we come to this group called the Bleatus. Um, and unlike the previous two groups we looked at with gills, these have these pores underneath. And what happens is the uh, spore is actually shot out of these and drifts on the, on the air currents. And they can drift for hundreds of miles. Seps are one of the most highly sought after uh, and best edible mushrooms to be found in our countryside. They're almost unmistakable and you can see they have got the, a very large uh, uh, stipe here which is quite bulbous but the cap is quite large. You want to get them early so that the slugs and other invertebrates don't munch away at them. But when, they, when you collect them like this, they are very good eating and they are almost unmistakable. So to compare a sep with something called a brown birch bolete, you can see they are somewhat similar. So you have to look very closely. As the name suggests, the brown, brown birch bolete is actually uh, only found under birch trees. And many of these uh, boletes have uh, relationships, mycorrhizal relationships with particular trees. One of the most remarkable features of the Boletus group is that some of them have the ability to undergo a dramatic color change when they're cut or exposed to the air. So this photograph was taken at Wellington Monument and you can see that this Boletus is uh, fingerprints here and where the cap has been bruised by, by touching, it's changing from red to a deep blue, blue colour. Closely related to that is this group or this individual the larch bolete. The pores are small and angular, and if you push them with your thumb or your finger, they start to darken. These are only found under or close to, to larch trees. And after a rain or on a, on a humid day, the cap becomes very slimy. So if you touch it, it feels horrible. But they are. Uh, quite an attractive uh, toadstool to come across. This beefsteak fungus exudes blood like droplets. It occurs on oak and it's one of the few fungi that got the ability to rot the heartwood wood of oak trees. If you cut it, it does indeed look like a beefsteak. I've never tried it, but I don't suppose it tastes like a beefsteak. This is a parasite and is the one that is feared by gardeners. The honey fungus can cause the death of trees and shrubs. It 
It said the only way to get rid of it in your garden is to move house. Here we have two examples of a group known as the ink caps. Unlike other gilled fungi, the gills slowly liquefy or deliquesce to aid the spore root dispersal. The ink can sometimes be used to write with. They're quite short lived and they will rot away and uh, just produce a puddle of ink on the ground. In a woodland on the Polden Hills, I found this, the wood mushroom. I'm using the word mushroom and toadstool interchangeably. However, some people think that mushrooms are, are the ones that are edible and others that toadstools are, are poisonous. That doesn't really hold true. There are many mushrooms that actually are poisonous or not very nice to eat. On a foray, it's always easy to keep your nose close to the ground searching the leaf litter. But you must also look up occasionally. And here we come across the very common birch polypore. Birches are, are relatively short lived trees, living only for 80 or 100 years or so. And that can, can be compared to an oak or a yew tree that can outlive humans by hundreds of years. This very common bracket fungi is also known as the razor strop and was once used to sharpen cutthroat razors. I believe it's also been used for entom by entomologists for pinning their samples to. Looking down again, this is the weird shape of a coral-like fungus growing on the woodland floor. It's important to note what fungi are growing on, whether they're growing on dead wood or on soil. And that is an aid to the identification. So here growing on a stump is the so-called stump puffball. And this one has neat little holes that allows the spores to be puffed out when raindrops or maybe small children hit the surface of the fungi. Closely related to that is the common earth ball. As you can see, this doesn't have a neat little hole, but later on, A ragged tear opens up. Maybe someone's trodden on it or a cattle, a cow has kicked it or something like that. And that exposes the, the uh, spore mass inside the fungi. These are, are very common, particularly on acid soils. The particular photograph here was taken at, uh, at West Hay Heath, the Somerset Wildlife Trust Reserve on the Somerset Levels. This is a, a bizarre fungi, but it's always a delight to find. It's a type of puffball, as you can see, with the same structure as on the other puffball, with a tiny hole in the top. But it's developed some legs that actually help push it up through the leaf litter, raising it above uh, the, the ground level so that the spores can be better distributed. This one is called the collared earth star, but there are a number of other species in this group, none of which I've seen, but collared earth star is relatively common in, in Somerset. This is an extremely common species, delightfully called the common curtain crust. Look closely and you'll find it's covered in a hair-like growth. It's grown here on dead wood. Resembling a burnt candle wick and growing on dead wood again, we find candle snuff. Again, as I say, it's a very common species and you can find this for much of the year.
Here we have cramp balls or King Alfred's cakes. They're virtually always found on ash or dead ash. It's said that if you put one in your pocket, you'll never get cramp, but you will get a dirty pocket because it'll produce lots of black spores. Growing on the fissures of the bark of the dead trunk of a birch tree is the so-called birch woodwort. You can find similar species on beech trees. They're very hard uh, incrustations and look a little bit like a lichen. Another deadwood fungi common on beach is this brittle cinder. As the name suggests, it becomes very brittle with age and breaks up. So this is another example of the fungi slowly rotting the tree away. Jelly ear. This is unmistakable and growing on elder. The ear-like structure, um, when fresh, does really resemble a human ear. But as it dries out, it shrivels up and doesn't last very long. The blackened fingers of a dead man here. This is closely related to the candle snuff fungi we've already encountered. And it's called dead man's fingers. There's a smaller, more dainty version, which is dead mole's fingers. Again, they grow on dead wood and help decompose. On conifers, the yellow staghorn uh, fungi, it catches the eye in the darkness of a, under a conifer plantation. Very attractive, but if you touch it, it's, it's very sticky. And this one, as I say, is mostly only ever found on various conifer species. A wonderful colored fungi, this one. These are the so-called ruspinate fungi that grow in sheets or crusts on um, twigs and branches. We found this one on the sands fungus foray a few years ago, and it's just in that, such an outstanding color. Black bulgar here, again growing on dead wood. To me, it looks a little bit like a wine gum, but I wouldn't recommend eating it. Here we've got a brain-like growth on a beech tree. Why fungi produce wonderful colors, I'm not clear on, I'm not, I'm not sure anyone truly understands that. It may just be a, a, a chance of evolution. Again, on a beech tree here, we can see the so-called split gill fungus. If you look underneath, the gills are actually uh, split down the center. So you can find this on dead wood, such as beech, Rather strangely, you can also find it on the polythene wrappers in hay bales in fields. How it's developed uh, the ability to grow on that, I do not understand. This is a very common fungi, uh, as are turkeys at this time of year. But the so-called turkey tail is one that you should find almost any time of year in almost any woodland habitat growing on dead wood. From turkeys to chicken, to chicken of the woods, in fact, this suede-like uh, bright yellow growth is, is on oak. I'm told this is good eating and lots of people seek it out. It's a fantastic bright yellow color.
Looking up again, this time up the stone trunk of, a, trunk of a beech tree, we find the wonderful porcelain fungus. If you touch the cap of the, fun of the fungus, the surface you'll find is, is very slimy and sticky, and your fingers will be covered in a, a very uh, mucousy sl type slime. This is probably bad news for the tree because it's the start of the tree's eventual death and rotting away. Here we have oyster mushroom, again growing on a dead wood here. In this case, the stipe is slightly off center and growing into the wood. This is one of the few fungi that are grown for human, uh, grown commercially for human consumption and appears somewhat earlier in the year in the wild. The southern bracket and the closely related artist bracket growing on beach here. As you can see, they produce a mass of brown spores that cover the surrounding vegetation. I quite often get asked on fungus forays, can I eat it? Well, this would be like chewing a lump of wood. They're solid masses of material that can last for many years. Related to that, to the bracket fungi here is, is the hoof fungus or tinder bracket, which is common in Scotland, but less so here in the south of England. The bracket is very hard. It's almost like a brick. And you can see here the concentric growth rings causing these, these steps in the bracket fungi. Underneath the spores, are the uh, pores are white. So here we have two examples of, of fungi with spines rather than gills or pores. These are the so-called hedgehog fungi, and they're highly prized. Many of them are very good eating. But I would say that they're very rare or becoming rarer. So if you do collect them, collect them very sparingly. Without gills, these are the wonderful jelly baby fungi. Here we can see them growing on the soil close to the Wellington Monument. They're quite small and quite difficult to find in the leaf litter. There are five or six different species of jelly babies. Deep in the woods, I came across this the other week, which is a Halvella species. I carried it home carefully if you do collect fungi, it's good to have some sort of container to carry them in. Never put them in a, a plastic bag because they just uh, rot and get broken and, and then are almost useless for identification or indeed for eating. You can actually dry fungi quite successfully. And like a plant in a herbarium, it's possible to preserve them for, for many years. I'm sure this is one species that many people will know. It's very easy to find due to the smell. This is the stinkhorn fungi. Shown on the left here is the egg-like structure that can be found uh, buried in the leaf litter. The fungi produce a very horrid smell. It smells like something has died. Uh, and that is used to attract flies and other insects to the cap here. So what happens is the spores then stick to the insect bodies and they fly away or carry them away to somewhere else in the woodland. I'm told if you're very brave, you can eat a stinkhorn fungus when it's in the egg form. But I've never done so and I don't think I ever will. On a SANS meeting at Shatwick Heath National Nature Reserve, 
we came across a strange growth on what are called the pseudocorns of the order tree. This is the so-called tongue gall. The growth from the cone there is actually a fungi. And we first recorded this at, at, in Somerset on this um, meeting. Then it was very rare, but now it seems to be quite common right across the county. So in July, August, you, you can start to find these. Okay, so returning to the car park here, and just outside the car park, we've finished our fungus foray, but one last species growing on this tree is a closely related to the order tungle is our witch's brooms. So here the fungus has infected the birch tree and produced the masses of growth, so a gall-like growth on the plant. Many fungi have strange folklore associated with them. Fungi are truly fascinating. And let's hope that next autumn we can meet up again and discover their wonderful natural history histories. I thank you very much for listening and happy to take any questions that people might have. Steve, that was absolutely brilliant. I, I, I don't know a great deal about fungi myself, but um, you certainly whetted my appetite for getting out there and having a good look for some now. And perhaps I'll be able to come along one day when we're all allowed out again on one of the fungus forays. That would be great fun. Let's hope so. Yeah, we've got uh, quite a few questions coming in, actually, which would be uh, nice if you could answer. Um, uh, yes, OK, so uh, somebody would like to know, we think all varieties have been recorded. Do we know if all varieties have been recorded by now or are, maybe there are new ones waiting to be discovered? Um, oh, uh, there, there will definitely be new fungi to be discovered. I think fungi are discovered probably every week of the year. Not so much in Britain now because it's it's relatively well known, but but in other parts of the world, then then we the fungus um, are not particularly. Uh, we've not got to the end of of what we can find out. I'm sure, mm. and even in this country, uh, they've done some work recently on the DNA of groups. So the Belitus group that I talked about, for example. They're finding uh, very complex relationships in those. So I'm sure we'll keep mycologists uh, uh, in business for, for many, many decades to come. Unfortunately, the, the, as with many groups, some are becoming extinct before they can be uh, found and, and named. Yeah. yeah, very sad, isn't it? And, uh, I mean, are people all over the world enthusiastic about uh, fungi? It's not just something that happens in Britain then. Well, quite the opposite, actually, because I think we're, we're not very, um, although we like to look at them, very few of us eat them. Mm. So if you go to the continent, um, oh, yeah. the, you know, a, a, they eat a lot more fungi out there than we do. Yes, and they're they much more aware of them. Yes. Well, they're baskets specially designed for going and picking mushrooms. They, they do. And, and dogs for going truffles and hunting Absolutely. and things like that. Yeah. Yes. So, right. yes, if, if you go uh, to other parts of, of Europe, certainly. Yeah. And they are used, um, then they're, they're much widely known. Yeah. Um, as I say, I, th I think in this country, we're, we're, we're interested in them. But um, sadly, in Somerset, there aren't that many people that I know of uh, studying them or, or understanding their distribution. Oh, well, you might have uh, got a fresh person enthusiastic, and, because I quite fancy the idea of that. And hopefully your lecture will have inspired quite a few people to join you next time. Tell me, okay. I Sorry? I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Um, are there any uh, medical uses for fungi, do you know? Uh, yes, there are. Yes. Uh, of, of course, I've only covered a, a very small uh, area here, just particularly for uh, woodland fungi. But yes, there, there are lots of medical uses, include, including things like penicillins and, and the oh. like. So yes, uh, a lot of... A lot of um, a lot of uses. 
yeah um right across the, the range yes i suppose people are discovering more as every day almost you know from looking at new types of fungi yes absolutely yeah 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 do, do all fungi have um is it, what do you call them microcosmal relationship with plants uh, no, not all fun fungi, um, a lot of them. So in our woodlands, about 90% of plants um, do form this mycorrhizal relationship. So that's, that's critical to their survival. So if you take something like an orchid, for example, um, orchid seed is, is very, very tiny. So it's that, that lucky happenstance that happens now and again. So they are dependent on that. And a so lot of our trees are. So when we're um, trying to conserve areas, we're looking after not just one plant because they're presumably all interrelated with their support network. That's, that's very true. You, you can't... The old days of trying to conserve a single species are probably ending now as we, we look much more at a landscape scale conservation where you've got to conserve the whole ecosystem. You can't have a, uh, conserve just particular elements of that. You need the yeah. whole yeah. the whole group of habitats and species yeah. together. Yes. Um, somebody here would like to know, are all Amanita species poisonous or are there some that you can eat? What was the Amanita one? I can't quite remember. So Amanita... Um, is includes the death cap and the so-called panther caps. Um, there is a false death cap, which might be edible if you boiled it, but who would take the risk? It's it's really so so probably not all, all poisonous, but just a few of them are very poisonous indeed. So some also have the effect of um, causing uh, your your brain to do strange things. So. Fly agaric, which was the bright red one with the white spots on. Yeah. That can cause um, you to have uh, visions and things like that. So it's probably used in, in tribal medicines and then, uh, by people like Shaman in the past. And probably why um, uh, witches fly and, and the like, you know, and maybe even why uh, Father Christmas flies on reindeer. A very complex story. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Won't go into that. Um, apart from honey fungus, are there any other species in Britain that are parasites, i.e. killing live organisms? Um, yes, yep, yep. The other, other species of fungi um, are parasites. And there's a whole group known as the rusts that um, affect plant growth. So every year you'll, you'll see farmers actually uh, spraying fungicides on 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 the fields of wheat and barley etc mm. to to stop some of these rusts yes and even in your garden you can find things the rust on um ground soil and and oxalis and little plants like that so they do many of them do have um adverse impacts on on plant growth yeah yes it's always very difficult isn't it growing things in gardens yes yeah. Um, uh, somebody would like to know, apart from the Sands annual foray, are there any individuals or groups recording fungi in Somerset? And is there a local mapping scheme? And who should you send results to if there is? That's a brilliant question, um, which I don't fully know the answer to. Hmm. Though there are fungus groups um, in the southwest. Uh, and I think if you, you, you Google fungus groups, you might find that. Of course, if you find anything in Somerset, you can report it to the Somerset Archaeological and uh, sorry, you can report it to Somerset, um, to CERC, Somerset Environmental Record Centre. Um, and I'm sure they've got a web page that you can actually enter your finds on or just send them in a photograph or an email with the, with the picture on there. Right, so that's Somerset Environmental Record, Record Centre, based based in Taunton. Yeah, based in Taunton. Oh well, that's yeah. useful to know. Thank yeah. you. With the uh, they're based with the Wildlife Trust on Wellington Road. Ah, oh, right. Thank you. That's useful to know that. 
Uh, somebody here says that several trees in Vivery Park have a dozen or more very large circular bushy growths in the branches. These have been there for years uh, and seem to get larger each year. Will these be the witch's broom that you mentioned? Uh, they could well be. So witch's brooms are, are, are found on, on various species. Yeah, uh, but um, I'm not sure they're doing any harm to the tree. They're just growing uh, the, the, in a sort of a haphazard um, fashion. But uh, yeah. yeah, it could, could very well be that. Yeah. The, the other thing that, of course, that grows in trees is mistletoe. Yes. And it's quite easy to um, confuse the two. And I know that the Somerset Rare Plants Group are currently running a, a mistletoe survey. So if people are interested in looking for things growing on trees, mistletoe is an ideal thing to, to look for this time of year. So if you go to the Somerset Rare Plants Group website, you can find details there how you, how you can take part in this citizen science um, survey that we've carrying out that they're carrying out at the moment. Yeah, sounds really good fun. Um, and and one, one last question for me, really. Um, how long do fungi last? And I think I'm talking about the fruiting bodies here rather than the bits underneath the ground. OK, so, uh, well, fungi are, are thought to be the oldest li living organisms on the planet or the longest living organisms on the planet. So they can live for uh, a very long time, thousands of years. Uh, the brackets that I showed on some of the trees can live for or be there for a few years. Um, and yet the little fungi that pop up in your lawn or in the, in the woodland, for example, mm. um, are very short lived. They're highly sought after by slugs and fungus gnats and other things yeah. that quickly break them down. Yeah. But the, the first touch of frost, uh, they, they tend to break down. So it, it depends. They can, they can live for a few years if it's a bracket or a very short period of time if it's a tiny little uh, yeah. thing growing on the leaf litter. Yeah, I've heard that some fungi are absolutely enormous and cover um, one, one um, fungus can cover miles or something. Yes, in the forests of, uh, I think it's Oregon in the USA, oh. um, there's a honey fungus that is, is, uh, covers uh, tens of square miles, maybe even larger than that. Wow. <laughs> so they are the oldest living organisms on the planet. Yeah. The longest living organisms on the planet, or some of them. And actually, it's, they think that probably fungi were the group that evolved that allowed the land plants to then colonize. So none of us would be here without fungi. And none yeah. of our woodlands would be here without fungi. They are incredibly important organisms. And we should be more mindful and, and take care of them because they're critical to us. Yes, I. I I quite like the idea of having a garden that's got quite a few bits of fungi in them, but I'm never sure whether it's sort of appropriate for growing vegetables or not. Uh, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe. It, it, maybe. They're quite difficult to, to um, cultivate, although you can buy you can buy these packs that you, you grow indoors, sort of thing. But, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My lawn is actually covered in um, in fungi, and it actually makes the lawn... Um, multicoloured at times of the year. Yeah. I quite and like another it. very valuable habitat is is ancient grasslands, old grasslands, church churchyards and the like, where you get um, an amazing display of wax caps fungi. And it's only recently we've realised how rare and how wonderful these things are. Yeah. And there are very many, uh, there aren't many, uh, there aren't very many sites in Britain that are actually protected for their fungi. So we need to do more to to look after them. Absolutely. Oh, I think that's really exciting. Um, I think we're coming towards the end of our questions now. I've got a mention here that somebody says there's a lot of mistletoe in Vivery Park. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, nice yeah. yeah. So, so, so mistletoe is, is not a fungi, but it, it's it's one it's one of those plants that's special at this time of year and well worth looking out for. Yeah. Okay, I think that's about it. I can't think of anything else that we need to ask. That's great. Thank Thank well, it's been a great so pleasure to, to give this talk, and I, I look forward to to meeting others next year on a fungus foray. Absolutely, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. 
so that's the end of our lecture for today. Um, SANS is hoping to plan further webinars very soon. At the end of February, Steve Park has offered to um, do a series of, of lectures on fungi. Uh, we haven't actually got the um, worked out the details of these yet, but if you keep an eye on the SANS website for updates um, uh, and also on the Facebook page, we'll let you know what the details will be as soon as possible. I think he's going to do about six lectures on it and um, one a week was the aim. Um, there's also links to the natural history part of the website uh, and uh, they've got um, um, link, links to previous uh, trips out that they've done, uh, including a fungi foray at Montacute last year. As always, we're always looking for donations at SANS, um, so the donations button will be there under the chat button on your um, page. So remember, chat button at the bottom of the page, and hopefully the donations button will be there. Thank you very much for coming to listen to our lecture today. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope we see you all again later on next year in 2021. So thank you and goodbye.